So on the occasion of International Women's Day, uh, we at the World Stroke Academy want to celebrate the achievements and careers of, of women in stroke. And we want to recognize their contributions, their research and their mentoring. We interviewed outstanding women who are nominated by WSO board members for their important work in the field of stroke. This is the fifth episode of the Women in Stroke Initiative podcast. I am Laura Titigalanos, Executive Manager of the World Stroke Academy, and I'm here today with Dr. Padma. Padma is a professor and head department of neurology and chief of neurosciences center in IEMS, New Delhi. The government of India awarded her the fourth highest civilian honor of the Padma Shri in 2016 for her contributions to medical science. Her research interest is primarily stroke, uh, vascular dementia, and multiple sclerosis. Dr. Padma, first of all, congratulations on the nomination from the WSO board members. It is wonderful to have you with us today. Thank you, Laura. Thank you so much. So we prepared a few questions for you, and I'm uh, hoping we can have a, a nice discussion on, on, on some of these topics today. And the first question that we wanted to ask you is, um, in terms of the, the term outstanding, so what does being outstanding in your field of work mean to you? And how do you usually measure success in a professional or personal level? Thank you. Thank you, Laura, once again. Well, um, the term outstanding in any field of work is outshining, right? You shine in every measure of excellence in parameters which are accountable in that particular field. So it may transcend the conventional boundaries of achievable targets or reach those impossible limits or whatever definition it, you, know, you may have. So in my field, uh, it will be essentially patient specific and patient first. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the, the cogent pillars, in fact, I would name them as three cogent pillars uh, on whom the academic medical hospital is built would be the clinical service, the education and the research. So outstanding to me, therefore, is a measure of subjective and objective assessment of these three pillars. So an outstanding clinician with a great acumen, clinical sense, or a great teacher who's capable of instilling the knowledge, the aptitude, the confidence in my students, a great researcher doing ethical, clinically impactful research, you know, which enhances evidence-based clinical practice. So when such efforts and such achievements can be recognized say, as outstanding by a peer group or a, the larger societal fabric, it becomes humbling. In fact, it becomes empowering to be able, you know, it gives you the impetus to do more, excel higher. So that's the definition of outstanding and what it means to my field. I, I would define that that way. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful answer. Thank you very much for that. And I, I totally agree with you, um, which brings me to my second question. Uh, besides um, you know, your field of work, neurology, in what other areas uh, would you have liked or maybe still would like uh, to stand out? Music, you know, music is what I would like to pursue still. And I'm, I'm sure I will, uh, I don't know when, maybe 20, 30 years, I, I don't know, but then I would like to, because to me, it's nearly the panacea for all evils, the world's greatest bomb. You know, nothing like a time, nothing like a music to heal a frayed nerve, broken spirit, or in fact, pain in any form. Uh, that, Laura, I want to bring in psych a bit here. You know, psych is a term which is integrally and inherently, it is entwined into the brain circuitry, into the neural networks, and they have spin-offs. You know, uh, they could be manifestation of symptoms, signs of a disease process, response to a diagnostic algorithm, and even management strategies. Therefore, we have this burgeoning understanding of these concepts of a psychoimmunology, psychopharmacology, psychotherapeutics, amongst you know, host of other science terms. You know, psych is there everywhere. And music therapy has a place in these, and I guess many more things. Importantly, for me, music is a getaway. It's a me time. You know, sometimes we need to ignore that sort of democracy forever hanging on our heads or you know, trying to walk that tight rope. Uh, you know, things to be done. 
it's okay. Sit back, recoup. You know, you 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 need to gather up your resources of energy, your reserves, and then you can face the world again. So that's music for me, and I'm sure I intend to learn, I intend to play, I, I intend to sing sometime. Yes, and I also would like to be a motivator. Uh, to be involved into a force which can empower women, I'm, I'm still finding ways to do so. I do it in my field every day for my young residents, my young colleagues, my patients, my caregivers. Mm -hmm. uh, but I intend to do that more, scale it up. I, I really want to uh, increase those efforts to empower in my own capacity uh, to give to the society. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I think that it's great that music is one of the things that you want to pursue, and I'm sure that you will do so with, with that passion. Uh, you brought up the, the topic now of, of, of women, of, of colleagues, of, of mentoring. So I have to ask you, in your opinion, um, what are some of the reasons for, for women's lack of advancement into, let's say, leadership position? Uh, it seems like there's no visible barriers, but are there actually? Yeah, Laura, uh, you said it. And and in fact, uh, thankfully, it's changing. I look at you. So it's changing. So we do have women, uh, have, you know, where, where it counts and in powerful positions to make the difference. But I, I do believe that there are invisible boundaries, the unspoken laws, you know, mm -hmm. the traditional so-called horizons, the conventional wisdom, you know, in quotes, the fear of unknown. You know, the apprehension of loneliness at the top, of being unacceptable, you know, you don't belong once you're at the top, of being no more in the peer group, support, comfort, safety. And I, I believe the gender equality work of work is not possible without a gender equality in the society. And believe me, Laura, this is much more applicable in a developing world the world where I come from, the developing world, that's where it actually is probably much more there. Uh, I'm not saying it's not there out there in the rest of the world, but it's much more palpable in the developing world. Because you see, the overall mindset of a society has a significant impact on the gender equality. And this is in spite of enforcement of laws. You know, There is a pushback. Uh, it's very often the women who uphold those obsolete, archaic, patriarchal beliefs, right? In the garb of traditions, in the garb of culture. Therefore, we need to rise from this all. It is, in fact, it is a unity amongst women, which is singularly of paramount importance to, to be able to face this. And, and look at women's mobility and the family honor. You know, there are, there are various geographic situations in this world where, women may face a number of restrictions when they step out of the house, how to behave, how to dress, whom to speak, whom not to speak, right? And mm -hmm. neighbors ask their questions, you know, why is your daughter-in-law coming home so late? Who is she talking to in the market? You know, you may not believe that these situations exist in a developed country, maybe, but it is out here, it's common. And mm -hmm. women acknowledge that many instances of even domestic violence are triggered by the idea of men being unable to accept their wife's newfound upward mobility. Mm -hmm. It's there. So if you look at the labyrinth of gender inequality and you look, look at women's doctors in the academic medicine, there, there's a lot of research which is also out there. Mm -hmm. And I looked into some of the, you know, the evidence which has been gathered. And what has emanated in that is that the junior women physicians are more vulnerable to gender discrimination. And this is across the world. And in fact, this research was uh, conducted in some of the very well-developed countries. And under pressure to excel at work, the work-family balance becomes a problem. And they experience an identity crisis. As mm -hmm. competent doctors, you also become competent, you need to be competent mothers, mm -hmm. right? And they found themselves to be isolated in multiple cultural context, you know, in a, in a traditional work frame. And, and the minimal level of leadership aspiration created a vicious cycle of, you know, lack of, of uh, maybe social networking, mentoring. So they, and in fact, women doctors felt that, you know, they need to, they need to face these skepticism. Will you endure long hours of surgery? 
will you endure these you know night shifts after night shifts you know mm -hmm. you know these kind of stuff which which is never thrown at a, a, a say a, a, a male right so right. and the maternity the child care you know all these things and there is there is one young doctor who commented in that research and and she's just said work family balance is a myth now that sh it should not come down to that and that's what we need to tell our young people that you know that the support system needs to be empowered that way that they don't have to to feel that because they often feel they, you know they may excel and then they have to struggle with feelings of guilt as mothers you know who feel that the children uh, have not really understood and you don't expect the child to understand your lack or your absence so uh, and, and then you know uh, laura it's also true that after work social gatherings are not really a very viable situation for us because when you work you work and then you go home you step into the house your uh, roles and your goal posts change you become a mother a daughter uh, you know uh, uh, a your 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 you're a wife so you know your goal posts are changing your roles are changing mm -hmm. and you have situations which you need to do so i think there are very many challenges which are thrown in for a women professional and more so i guess in a medical profession which is can be very exacting and so i i, I do believe that society as a such if it can uh, wake up to these and i think it's a societal network which needs to change and gender doesn't need that it doesn't need to be the defining uh and uh process or a term you don't have to be a male or a female you're a human being and you can excel and so being able to excel doesn't need to have a definition whether you're a man or a you or a woman and i think that needs to come up front from the society from the time you're born from the way you're raised to how you are seen by a peer group your superiors your your employees your employers everywhere mm. but i think it is changing and it is changing for the better i see a lot of hope yes <laughs> thank you so much for this answer i think you depicted the the reality in a, in a very nice way which makes me wonder if uh as a doctor but i will mostly ask you as a as a woman uh what would be your advice then to you know maybe younger female colleagues out there who feel currently that they are not taken seriously by by patients or even colleagues maybe superiors at work would you have some maybe words of wisdom for them i don't know about wisdom laura uh, i i'm still learning too in spite of my so many years of uh, being on this earth but uh what i do feel i i do have some take home messages yes uh you know the again as i said the culture change should be at a, both the individual level in fact i would say individual organizational and at a national level now these are imperative to discontinue those vicious cycles you know they do exist in the labyrinth of women's physicians career development women professional career development and since uh, you know we are attached to academic medicine i have more uh, experience in dealing in the realm of academic medicine so along with i think promoting inclusive workplaces and transforming this gender relations within the workplace empowering women workers to access their rights advocating for a behavior change across the supply chain i must say you know there is an inherent need to address gender justice within families and then go on to i guess educational spheres and then professions and we also should enable communities to look at working women with respect you know mm -hmm. uh, one without the other will be lacking you know it's it's a glass uh, only half full it's not going to help but to me as as a uh, older sister as a mother you know to all the young people out there you know what i would advise is first know your aspirations and your attitude you know in other words what's your calling don't do things because someone else told you to do or someone else says that is the wisest thing to do what's your calling what is it that makes you feel happy do that choose your life partner well laura absolutely essential because 
nothing nothing will substitute a warm home you mm. may have a grueling day but when you walk into that home and that's warm that's what you need so choose your life partner well okay and have a hobby you must have a me time you know you you take care of the whole world but you need you need to take care of yourself it's only when you're well that the world is going to be well so you must have a me time and be happy in what you do no false pretenses there should be no pretentious belonging you are unique in whatever you are you're beautiful and you're precious in what mm-hmm. you have you have to believe in yourself then the world starts to fall in place the world will believe in you and for this physical health is sine qua non to mental health so take care of yourself it's important there's no point you know sacrificing your your physical health and 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 feel that you know the the sacrifice will somehow transform it to become a better thing around you no you right. need to be well and make everything well and i i think the last thing laura is you know what are the quintessential women's traits tell me it is empathy and patience mm-hmm. that's motherhood but even if there is no motherhood that's a quintessential woman's trait it is patience and empathy you know that's our integral inherent power so use them when you use them you persevere you persist when you persevere and persist you excel remember knowledge is power and that would be my take home message to all the young beautiful you know neurologists who are there and i firmly believe it's a younger generation which is more brilliant more intelligent and and they have more power than and that's just evolution from an older generation the younger generations are brighter you're much brighter than you know my generation so mm-hmm. use your power knowledge is power mm-hmm. Bless Thank you. you so much for for this inspiring uh, interview. Really inspired. I have uh, goosebumps to be honest. Um thank you for choosing these words and for choosing this message most of all and for contributing with this interview to the World Stroke Academy. I want to congratulate you again for the nomination and I'm hoping that we can have more of these conversations in the near future. Thank you so much. God bless you, Laura. Thank you. Thank you.